share some uh, stories with you all. Um, but thanks very much for inviting me to, to talk. I, I think the, the, the previous presentation was excellent um, and it's uh, a good lead in to me. I'm going to st step out a bit and give a bit more of a wider view of the latest evidence around physical activity for health and how much we need to do with a particular lens of looking at this through walking and uh, walking pace. Uh, so just a, a, a quick note on the physical activity guidelines. Um, there's been uh, work by WHO, by the Chief Medical Officer in the UK, by the uh, uh, Americans and others to update the physical activity recommendations from getting rid of uh, bout recommendations. So now the, 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 the key thing is 150 minutes per week of uh, physical activity needs to be done. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter how that's parcel throughout the week it can be done on uh several days it can be done uh, over lots of short uh, short bouts um, and, and that's the key change really from from previous uh, recommendations and actually this maps on very well to the latest uh, evidence that we have now for physical activity and health when we use objective measures previously we've had to ask people how active we uh, they are and then look at their answers uh, against future health outcomes but now we're able to track people's activity through accelerometers, and we've got some really good international data sets now that look at that uh, against mortality or cardiovascular risk. And this was a nice uh, study that I was involved with, published in a BMJ that looked at international data sets uh, for all-cause mortality. And the really interesting thing with this data is you can see you get a very steep dose response curve uh, in terms of the benefits of becoming more active, um, and that bottoms out at around about uh, uh, what's equivalent to um, just over 20 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week. And beyond that, in this data set, at least, you weren't getting much more additional benefit. Um, so it could actually be the fact of physical activity that more isn't always better. But for inactive individuals, uh, even having quite small uh, differences to activity can give uh, a quite substantial health benefits. You can see here that it was bottoming out at, at around a 60% reduction. We've, we've looked at what's the minimum amount of physical activity needed to improve health uh, in, 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 in inactive individuals. Um, and uh, across the evidence, we've triangulated it, uh, triangulated it across different uh, streams of evidence and come to the conclusion that in order to get at least some benefit to be becoming more active, people need to be doing increasing their activity by at least 500 steps a day or five minutes of brisk walking. And I think it's a reasonable question to ask is that do those 500 steps matter in terms of the intensity that they're undertaken? And this was another uh, nice study that's been recently published looking at ob objective measures trying to work out how the impact of intensity versus volume impacts on health. And in this case, again, it's looking at uh, all-cause mortality. So if I just draw your attention to this top line, this top line is light intensity movement. And uh, a very low proportion was done at, uh, at moderate to vigorous intensity. Um, and so this is people on their feet posturing around, um, you know, sitting down less and on, on their feet a bit more, but not actually engaging in purposeful movement. And the more people are on their feet and the more they moved around, the lower the risk of mortality in a very nice dose response way, uh, uh, continuing to get some benefit in this data set beyond what's equivalent to about 150 minutes a week of exercise. The interesting thing, though, if you look at this bottom line, was that individuals who moved around briskly um, had a really substantial reduction in mortality risk regardless of their physical activity volume. So even people who didn't actually accumulate that much activity, if when they were active, they were doing that in a much more intensive way, such as brisk walking, um, they had a, a, a low risk of mortality, regardless of how much volume they, 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 they were putting in. And we've had some nice data looking at the UK Biobank um, and looking at uh, how walking pace, simply how quickly people walk when, when they are walking, how that maps on to survival risk. Um, and this is across a slow, steady average or brisk and slow is less than uh, three miles an hour and brisk is more than four miles an hour. Uh, the interesting thing with this data is that if we look at um, uh, uh, men here, is that uh, slow walkers who led otherwise exemplary lifestyles were lean, 
had good nutrition, got enough sleep, didn't sit too much. Those individuals had worse survivals than brisk walkers who had very unhealthy lifestyles otherwise. Um, and so th this just shows the power of uh, intense movement or more intense movement to people's health status. My, my talk was uh, titled uh, Walking Pace as a, as a Vital Sign. And we've actually looked at risk prediction with, with walking pace and compared that to a whole range of other lifestyle and biomedical factors that are used to uh, predict cardiovascular risk. Um, and for, for women, we can see that walking pace here was the second strongest predictor of CBD mortality, uh, stronger than cholesterol, stronger than blood pressure stronger than any other lifestyle factor. The only uh, other factor that was slightly stronger than it was smoking status. So smokers had, was slightly, you can have a slightly stronger predictor than you did for walking pace. When you adjusted for the things that were in the score, um, risk score, so cholesterol, smoking, uh, uh, age, etc., walking pace still stood out for women and it was still by far and away the strongest predictor compared to the other lifestyle factors. Uh, for men, uh, walking pace was the strongest predictor of CBD mortality compared to all these other risk factors, including smoking, blood pressure, BMI, uh, cholesterol, etc. And it remained highly significant and very strong compared to everything else that we looked at after uh, adjustment. Um, so that's, again, showing the power of uh, brisk walking to our overall health status. We've also looked at this in type two diabetes and found these results are even stronger. So walking pace is important for the general population, but it's even more important for people with type two diabetes in, in, in terms of future risk prediction. So if you've got type two diabetes and you also move about slowly, uh, you have a much higher risk of going on to have future health events. We've looked at walking pace and telomere length. The previous colleague mentioned uh, the importance of exercise to biological aging um, and some very recent data that we've worked with uh, Professor Nero Shamani and others in the, our cardiovascular sciences department uh, have, have looked at what happens if you have two people that have equivalent chronological age, say 60 years old. And when we look at their telomeres and undertake Mandelian randomization on uh, the link between uh, walking pace and biological age or biological age and walking pace, we see that there, does, uh, there is an indication that walking pace is, predicts or causes biological age, but biological age doesn't cause walking pace. Um, and over a lifetime exposure to brisk walking, there was an equivalent of a 16 year difference in biological age between slow and brisk walkers. Um, uh, really quite uh, incredible and almost too good to be true, uh, uh, really. But I think, again, just showing us the power that if you live your life consistently with undertaking physical activity and, and brisk um, uh, physical activity, then that can have a really strong lifetime uh, effect on our health and uh, on our biological age. We're in the midst of a, uh, a COVID pandemic, as we all know. Um, we've had the opportunity again to look at how physical activity and walking pace predict severe disease or mortality from COVID-19. Obviously, it doesn't affect people get affected or to a much lower extent, but it does have an impact on severe disease or mortality. So just drawing your attention to what was looked at here, we looked at uh, different walking pace categories and different categories of overweight uh, and, and obesity. I mean, made the reference normal weight individuals who are brisk walkers. So compared to this reference group here, uh, slow walkers had a much higher risk of severe disease and over four times the risk of mortality, regardless really of their overweight and obesity status. Uh, in this cohort, at least, it was you had a lower risk being a brisk walker with obesity than you did being a slow walker who was normal weight. Perhaps quite surprising results, given that we know just how powerful obesity is in itself uh, uh, for risk marker of COVID-19. Uh, so what does this mean for patients with type 2 diabetes and uh, high risk of diabetes in terms of the natural e evolution of what you would anticipate to see in a primary care or clinical setting? 
So this is some data that we have generated in a cohort of individuals with type 2 diabetes or high risk of diabetes, where we follow them up over time with uh, accelerometers. And unsurprisingly, over time, people became more sedentary. Um, and that, in that increase in sedentary behavior was predominantly at the expense of light activity, but moderate to vigorous activity also decreased over time. And when we looked at it in categories here, uh, that was borne out. So over 44% of the population um, moved light activity into increased sedentary behavior. So they were changing time on their feet, uh, moving around at light intensity to time sitting down more. Uh, and and or um, uh, uh, reducing intensity of move, other movement into more uh, lighter activity. The individuals that were able to buck this trend, um, there was uh, just under 5% of them. So this was people that moved sitting time into moderate to vigorous activity for at least five minutes. And in these individuals, there was a significant improvement in a cardiometabolic risk with this very small change in behavior with this was just changing five minutes of sitting into five minutes of brisk walking or equivalent of brisk walking and doing that the natural history of that in this population was that they had improved cardiometabolic health over time uh, direct relevance to the south asian phenotype we know that um uh, South Asians in the UK. Um, I come from Leicester, which, which has very large South Asian and Indian migrant cohorts, have a higher risk of diabetes and a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so we've looked at how the response to exercise differs between different ethnic groups. Um, and if you get people in, uh, in control, and these were people with a high risk of diabetes, so pre-diabetes, and if you have people in a control condition, so they're sitting down and you're looking at a mixed meal tolerance test, unsurprisingly in this cohort, um, South Asians had a higher insulin resistance index. The interesting thing was that exercise reduced insulin resistance in both South Asians and white Europeans, but for the um, high intensity interval training, which we heard about previously, uh, there was a much greater response in the South Asian phenotype and indeed they had come down to a level that was lower than white Europeans to start off with, but also lower than white Europeans following the bout of exercise. So everything that I've talked about today may be particularly relevant uh, to um, uh, the, the, the migrant South, South Asian phenotype in the UK, but also with uh, translational Im uh, implications uh, uh, more, more widely. So really important uh, therapy to managing uh, glycemic health. So, how does that? How can we translate these findings into practice, or indeed, can we translate these findings into into practice? So, how effective have our behaviour change interventions been at changing behaviour in multi ethnic uh, communities in the UK or elsewhere? So, we've recently had our Propels trial published in uh, BMC Medicine, which was a four year exercise intervention or physical activity intervention in a, a multi-ethnic uh, group of patients with uh, pre-diabetes. Um, we, we randomized people to usual care, people that were given our walking away program, uh, which is a group-based uh, pr pragmatic intervention with predominantly use and personalized step per day goals. Uh, and that same intervention plus an M health intervention, so mobile phone support, text messaging support, and uh, some counseling support as well from um uh, trained uh, behavior change experts. And what we found from this was that we were uh, effective over the first 12 months in those that were given the M Health version of the program in getting over this five, that five minute minimum clinically important difference that I talked about earlier. So, a very pragmatic intervention that mostly relied on remote contact could get this behavior change over uh, 12 months. But after four years, 48 months, this intervention, the intervention effect had worn off both on overall activity, overall walking, and also brisk walking as well, which are these censored uh, steps here. So effective over one year, but we weren't able to su sustain that behavior change uh, into the longer uh, term. 
we've looked at some of the reasons for that across our program of, of, of research more generally and found that actually anxiety, anxiety and depression, but particularly depression, are really strong uh, determinants of uh, engage and uh, response to these behaviour change interventions. People that are baseline coming onto our programmes that have no or just one or few uh, depressive symptoms do go on over the longer term to get that 500 step per day increase in activity compared to control conditions. But the, the more depressive symptoms people have, the less effective the intervention is. Um, there, there was some hope in this database because we modeled what happened if you improved depression symptoms at the same time as promoting activity. And if you did that, you could still get that 500 step per day increase uh, with higher levels of depression in people in the program. Again, really strongly relevant to the South Asian phenotype in the, in, in the UK. We know that our South Asian populations have a much higher uh, rate of depressive symptoms and also a much higher risk of actually meeting that, the, 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 the threshold for depression itself, uh, up to three times uh, greater risk. And that risk was not explained by anything that we could adjust for, for including environmental factors, uh, pollution factors, um, a whole range of uh, socio-demographic uh, factors that we uh, adjusted for. So going forward in our programmes, we need to be better at promoting physical activity, but also um, targeting people's underlining determinants of physical activity that are going to uh, affect whether the intervention is effective or not at promoting behaviour change. So this is not unique to our study. There's uh, pretty much any longer term physical activity intervention that has been published um, internationally. This was data from India looking at physician led intervention, very similar findings, nice response at uh, one year or up to one year. But beyond that, your the, the intervention effect is tailing off and you're getting below that five minute a day uh, threshold. This was in people with type two diabetes. And also in the look ahead study as well from the United States, a very famous, uh, very intensive study. But even with all the resources they had and the intensity of the intervention, they saw exactly the same thing. Uh, a, a very nice uh, impact of the intervention in terms of physical activity promotion at one year. But that had waned after four years and they simply weren't able to, to, to keep that. So really, they're headline from my from my particular talk is that there's some good news really in terms of patients talking to patients that they don't have to be doing that much more than they are now to get actually quite important health outcomes it can be as little as five minutes and working up from there the bad news is that even that small amount of activity can be hard to sustain and we really need to think about better ways of uh, doing that in, into the future otherwise we're going to have this fantastic therapy that has these fantastic benefits, but patients simply aren't utilizing it. Uh, thank you very much.